2012, I had a moment which made me change the way I thought about my job. I had taken an underground train to London Bridge Station, and I got out, and I went through this kind of nondescript blue door that was covered in warning signs. I showed some identification to the security guard, and he waved me into a metallic cage, and the doors shut behind me. It kind of shuddered and jolted and then started to move up towards the sky. And after a few minutes, it stopped and the doors opened. I stepped out and I had to give myself a minute for my eyes to adjust to the bright light. And I felt the cold, fresh atmosphere of London hit me. I was at the top of a skyscraper. And as a structural engineer, I had played a role in designing that. And I stood there looking down on London and I could see tiny human shaped dots walking around the streets. I saw buses and cars that looked like toys bustling around the urban landscape. And I saw Victorian buildings right next to modern skyscrapers. From up there, London, this busy city of eight million people, looked quite calm and serene. I could have stood there for hours watching the view, but as can happen to the best of us at even the most inopportune of moments, nature called. And so I went to the toilet, and these toilets had floor-to-ceiling high windows, which were a little bit disconcerting, and it meant that I didn't have to stop admiring the view as I went about my business. I pressed a button, and some water gushed out and took the waste away down through the building and into sewers under the streets of London. I went back out and admired the view for a bit longer, and then I went home. Looking down on this intricate, complex metropolis that is London that day really stayed with me. It made me realize that we tend to take our physical surroundings, our skyscrapers, the trains, the sewers under our streets, for granted, and we associate them with permanence. But actually, even though humans have been on our planet for over 200,000 years, it's only really in the last 200 years that this vast remodeling of our landscape has occurred. Today, I want to tell you the stories of people, everyday people just like you and me, who contributed to this change. Three people that thought tinkered and toiled to solve a problem that they faced. Three engineers that in a moment of realization came up with something brand new. Three moments which could have otherwise faded into insignificance in history, but instead have had a momentous impact on the lives of the people that lived centuries after them. Henry was always a really inventive and creative child. He used to break into his father's factory to try and discover its secrets. When Henry was 17, his family moved to London, and he was inspired by the big capital city. And filled with youthful optimism, he decided to try and make himself a name as an inventor. In 1854, during the Crimean War, he decided that he wanted to try and improve the weapons that the British and French armies were using. And he did this by increasing the amount of gunpowder in each shell. And when he showed his invention to the general in Napoleon's army, they were impressed, but they were slightly concerned that the guns themselves were not strong enough to take this extra firepower, that these guns would explode and injure their own soldiers. So Henry said, well, in that case, he's just going to have to go and improve the quality of the guns themselves. <coughs> Henry's invention happened almost by accident. He had a homemade furnace in which he used to try and purify iron. So the problem with the guns was that they were made from cast iron, which had lots of impurities in it. And he was trying to remove these impurities in a different way. So normally, they were removed by heating it up with coal. But he decided, well, why don't I try actually just blowing air into this furnace? So he did that. And a few sparks started to come out of the furnace. And he expected that, because a chemical reaction had started. But suddenly, 
what happened was that the oxygen in the air combined with the carbon impurities in the iron, and this released a huge amount of heat very suddenly. A raging inferno started up. Henry jumped back as a volcano of sparks erupted from the furnace. There were mild explosions, and molten metal was being flung all over his workshop. And he stood there watching all of this with a mixture of terror and also a bit of excitement. Ten frightening minutes later, the whole thing calmed down and he went up to the furnace to look at what had happened. And inside, he found pure molten iron. Now that he had pure iron to start with, it was much easier for him to add back the perfect amount of carbon in order to make steel. Now steel up to that point had been very expensive and difficult to make because of this method of trying to heat the iron up with coal. It just, they couldn't purify it enough. But with Henry Bessemer's new way of using hot air to purify iron, suddenly the material steel was six times cheaper than it had ever been in the past. Henry Bessemer Steel very quickly replaced all the iron tracks that were being used on our railway system. Steel tracks lasted 10 times longer than iron tracks did. They were less prone to corrosion. They were much easier to look after. And the result of that was that trains could run faster on these new tracks. They could design heavier trains, larger trains, and transport became cheaper. Fresh fish from the coast, which was once considered a luxury, could now be transported inland. And goods could be taken from one side of the country to another. People, people and their ideas could go from city to city and even cross the borders of their countries in a single day. Our modern railway still runs on steel tracks made by the Bessemer process that was originally intended to improve the quality of guns. In 1852, a man called Elisha was working as a mechanic in a factory. His entire career had consisted of him moving from job to job, from place to place. He'd never really found his calling in the world. And now aged 40, he found himself carrying heavy crates of goods from one level of this factory to another and he was tired. He thought there must be a better way of doing this. Now, movable platforms had been used in the centuries before them. I mean, even the Romans used these platforms to get their gladiators from the basement of the Colosseum up into the arena. But the problem with these platforms were that they were very unreliable and unsafe because the ropes that held these platforms up could snap at any time and they would plummet to the ground and kill their occupants. So Elisha tinkered around with a few different things. He tried using this special spring, and he attached the rope to the spring to this platform in a different way. He replaced the plain guide rails that the platform would go up and down with toothed or ratcheted rails. And so when the platform was all working okay and the rope was intact. It would go up and down these rails as normal and the spring was stretched and it was straight. But if the rope snapped, then the springs were released and the straight springs would release into a C shape that would catch in the toothed or ratcheted rails and act as a brake to stop the platform from falling. Financial problems at the factory caused it to shut down and Elisha thought once again, he has to move west, and he decided to try his luck in California's gold rush. But just as he was about to leave, a furniture manufacturer in New York called him and asked to purchase two of his inventions. So he decided to try and set up a shop in the corner of this now disused factory, realizing that if he really wanted this business to take off, he had to prove to people that it worked. <coughs> His big chance came at the 1854 Crystal Palace Exposition in New York. He assembled his safety platform with the rope and the spring and the ratcheted rails 
in the big hall. And he had a lot of goods placed on top of this platform. As a curious crowd started to gather around, he himself climbed on top of the platform. And then he asked his assistant to raise the platform up to its very highest setting. He then asked his assistant to sever the rope. With a dramatic swing of an axe, the rope was cut. And in that moment, Elisha knew that this could end in two ways for him, in death or in immortality. The crowd gasped as the platform started to plummet, but after falling only a few inches, the springs caught into the ratcheted rails and the platform stopped. It had worked. And they heard Elisha shout, all safe, gentlemen, all safe. He was unharmed. <coughs> Elisha Otis's company, called Otis, till today supplies lifts to countries all over the world. Before Otis invented the safety lift, we could only design buildings that were five or 10 stories high because climbing more stairs than that was physically impractical. But he had opened the sky to us and we went from having five or 10 story high buildings to buildings that were 50 or 60 stories high. Sprawling cities could now accommodate their burgeoning populations up. They built up and fit the more people in. The skylines of cities like Hong Kong, New York, would have been completely unimaginable if it hadn't been for Otis's safety lift, which he invented to carry crates from one level of a factory to another. London was a really disgusting place to live in in the 1850s. Once upon a time, the River Thames and all of its tributaries had beautiful, clear, fresh water. But as the population of London increased by the mid 13th century, the quality of that water had really deteriorated until they were basically open sewers. But it was worse than that because people had started disposing carcasses of animals and even human bodies into the tributaries and the river. And the shocking thing is that citizens still relied on these bodies of water with carcasses floating in them for drinking. There were 200,000 cesspits in London. So you did your business in a chamber pot in your home and then you would transfer the contents into this large pit. But because it was so expensive to have these pits cleared out, they usually just lay there, stagnant and festering. The summer of 1858 was particularly hot. The full cesspits lay there, festering and stinking. And fumes rose from the river and its tributaries. And the smell was so bad that that year was given a special name, the Great Stink of 1858. The ministers working in the Houses of Parliament had decided to move to Oxford because they simply couldn't work in these conditions. Joseph, an engineer, had been racking his brain about how to solve this problem of waste in London. And perhaps as a response to the Great Stink of 1858, in 1859, his proposals were accepted by the city. He designed three levels of sewers with branches all over London <coughs> Street, which traveled from west to east. And he designed pumping stations at places such as Abbey Mills. He allowed for a generous portion of waste for every one of the four million people living in London at the time and came up with a size for his pipes. But then he thought, well, we're only gonna do this once, so we might as well do it properly. And he doubled the size of the pipe. And because of that momentary whim that Joseph Bazalgette had, we have a sewer system in London today that we still use, not one which was overwhelmed decades ago. In 1875, his 1,300 miles 
of sewers had been completed and the cholera epidemics that had been until that point killing tens of thousands of Londoners stopped. We went from a society that lived around these full, horrible cesspits and dying of cholera to a city that could open its taps and get fresh water and not worry about dying of cholera. 150 years on, Londoners are still indebted to Joseph Bazalgette for our health. Because of these three engineers, because of their special moments, our lives are unrecognisable compared to 200 years ago. Following my sort of special moment at the top of the Shard in 2012, I realised that far too often we take these changes in our lives and the game changes themselves for granted. So since then, I've been working to try and raise the profile of engineering to tell people of the amazing impact it has on our world and to encourage children to study science and engineering and to solve problems. What changed these three people from tinkerers to game changers was a special moment. It was that moment when Henry Bessemer decided that the materials being used for guns was not good enough. It was that moment when Otis felt that the weight of these crates he was carrying was just too heavy for him. It was that moment when Joseph Bazalgett decided that soaking his curtains in a mixture of lime chloride to try and hide the stench of London was simply a step too far. I wonder whether these engineers were aiming to change the world. I think that actually they were merely trying to solve a problem that they faced and probably they themselves were astounded at the impact that their inventions had on the planet. So what will your moment be? What are the minor irritations that you have in your everyday life when you say to yourself, I wish it was easier to do this, or why can't we do this in a slightly different way? It's the people that try and change these minor irritations, that try and solve these problems that can really bring real change. Like the three engineers we heard about today, you don't have to aim to change the world in order to change the world. Thank you.